Our next speaker is <laughs> the, 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 um, Peter Bantz, <laughs> also known as Bupinder Singh Bantz. He's a renowned Sikh historian, um, independent researcher, and antiquarian. He's a prolific writer who has published works on Sikh migration and the establishment of the Sikh temples um, in the UK. He um, has written for the Times, and um, that's not the New York Times, I imagine that's uh, no, the, the, the Times, Times. <laughs> yeah, the UK one, and the Oxford National Biography. He's an authority on the life and family of Maharaja uh, Dulip Singh and has the largest collection of memorabilia relating um, to the Maharaja. His collections have been exhibited worldwide, including at the Vic Victorian Albert Museum, the British Museum, and the Bard Graduate Center in New York. Uh, please join me in welcoming Peter Vance. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Wahiguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahiguru Ji Ki Fateh. I would firstly like to thank the Sikh Foundation, Dr. Kapani, Sonia Dami, for inviting me here this afternoon. I'd also like to congratulate the Sikh Foundation on its 50th anniversary. I've been given 15 minutes to talk about the life of Maharaja Dalip Singh, a subject which is very dear to me. Um, but I have to uh, confess, my talk will be longer than 15 minutes, so I'll go on. I'm going to start with a portrait of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. This, is a, this portrait is pretty much uncirculated, uh, but it's a very important painting because this particular oil painting was in the possession of Maharaja Dalip Singh when he came to England. He had this painting with him at his house in Elverdon for many years, and it was passed down to his son, Prince Victor Dalip Singh. When Victor died in 1918, it was passed to his wife, and then the painting disappeared and it's only recently surfaced. I'm not going to talk about Ranjit Singh in great detail because we've got some eminent historians on Ranjit Singh, but I'd like to touch on the relationship between the Sikh Empire and the British. Now, by 1805, the British realized Maharaja Ranjit Singh as a major powerhouse in the Indian subcontinent, and they sought a treaty with him. By 1809, we had the Treaty of Amritsar, which recognized the border between Ranjit Singh's Punjab and British India. After 40 years, Ranjit Singh, well, after 40 years of rule, Ranjit Singh dies in 1839. And that's when the history of Punjab gets a, gets a bit messy. The problem is, Ranjit Singh had seven sons from various different Maharanis. And when you have this situation, each mother wants their son to be the king. Ranjit Singh passed on the kingdom to his eldest son, Karak Singh. Now, Karak Singh was a very weak man, and he was overthrown by his own son, Nornihal Singh. Within a year, Karak Singh passes away, and Nornihal Singh, on the day of his father's cremation, rides back into the Lahore fort, when the masonry of the Lahore fort falls upon him and kills him. Sher Singh becomes the next Maharaja in 1841, but in 1843, he too is assassinated by the Sundarwaliya Sardars, as they believe he was implicated in the murder of the widows of Karak Singh and Nornihal Singh. The other five sons of Ranjit Singh put forth their claim to the throne of the Punjab, but the court of Lahore f favored the five-year-old Dalip Singh. And that's because his maternal uncle, Jawahar Singh, yielded great influence in the royal court. And here we can see a beautiful painting by Erga Schurft, of Maharaja Dalip Singh. Um, he was a Hungarian artist who visited Lahore during the reign of Maharaja Sher Singh. Dalip Singh, born on the 4th of September, 1838, to Ranjit Singh and his wife, Maharani Jindkor, known as Jinda. So in 1843, Maharaja Dalip Singh becomes the Maharaja of the Punjab, and as any five-year-old, he enjoys the fruits of his position. But his maternal uncle, Jawahar Singh, abuses his position. It is said that he had the other sons of Ranjit Singh put to death. By 18, 1845, Jawahar Singh is summoned to the Sikh camp. 
Very cleverly, he takes the Leap Singh with him on his elephant, thinking, the Sikh army will dare not touch me if the Leap Singh is present. But how wrong he is. When he enters the Sikh camp, he's ordered off his elephant, he's shot, and his head is surveyed off. Now, Maharani Jinda, on an accompanying palaquin, can only watch her brother being brutally murdered in front of her very eyes. Now, it's said to punish the Sikh army, she sends them to the southern border to provoke war against the British. Now, I won't go into the ins and outs of the First Anglo-Sikh War because this really is a, a subject for a talk on its own. But the end result was the Sikhs were defeated, Kashmir was sold to Raja Gulab Singh, and the British entered the Punjab. They installed a British resident who would administer and look after the kingdom when Maharaja Dalip Singh reached the age of 16. And for this, they would charge the government a hefty fee. A whole array of changes start taking place in the Punjab. In 1847, the Queen Mother, Maharani Jinda, is taken away from Lahore. She's incarcerated in the fort of Shekhapura and then completely taken away uh, from the Punjab. A year later, a small skirmish, uh, a small outbreak of uh, Sikh soldiers, a revolt breaks out in the province of Multan. Now, there's two reasons for this, uh, this revolt. Firstly, the Sikh soldiers are unhappy at the way the Queen Mother has been treated. And secondly, they believe that the British are here to stay and they are not going to give the kingdom back to Dalip Singh when he reaches the age of 16. Now, the Governor General, Lord Dalhousie, could have easily quashed this rebellion, but he allows it to escalate, so it gives him the perfect opportunity to send in the heavy artillery and annex the Punjab to British India. Maharaja Dalip Singh has to cede for himself all rights to the kingdom of the throne of the Punjab, in return, he's allowed to keep his title of Maharaja Dalip Singh Bahadur and given a pension of no less than 40 and no more than 50,000 pounds per annum. Now here we can see a watercolour painted by Lady Helen Mackenzie, who was the wife of a British officer serving in the Punjab. She was one of the first European ladies to meet the Maharaja and she really had a sympathy uh, for the poor, for the poor 10-year-old Maharaja. On the left, we can see the first photograph of Maharaja Dalip Singh taken by an amateur photographer in the Indian Army called John McCosh. And on the right, we can see a watercolour by James Harding, who was the nephew of the Governor General, Sir Henry, Sir Henry Harding. The Leap Singham was now placed under the guardianship of Sir John Logan, a Scottish Army doctor in the Indian Army. And amongst Sir John's first duties was to remove the Maharaja from the Punjab and take him away to a place called Fatehgarh Park in Uttar Pradesh, at a cantonment. Now, the Maharaja spent four years at this cantonment, and during the summer months, he would spend at the Kaula Hill Station of Masuri. During this time, the Maharaja expressed a wish of becoming a Christian. At Fatigar, he was completely surrounded by European boys and European children. The cantonment was actually a place for the wives and children of European officers serving in India. He expressed a wish of becoming a Christian and within the confines of his house in Fatigar, he was formally baptised. Sir John Logan had the Maharaja commissioned, uh, well, Sir John Logan commissioned this lovely oil painting uh, by the artist George Beachy. And this would be a parting gift uh, to be given to Lord Dalhousie. And Lord Dalhousie had given permission for the Maharaja to go to London on a so-called educational trip. In return, Lord Dalhousie gave the Maharaja this beautifully bound and inscribed Christian Bible which is now on display at Fetford Museum in England. The Maharaja arrived in England in 1854, in the month of May, and was given an immediate audience with Queen Victoria. She took an instant liking to him. She encouraged him to mix with the royal princes. He even holidayed with the family at Osborne House. Many of you may be familiar with this painting. Uh, the Queen, uh, Queen Victoria, commissioned this portrait by her favourite artist, Winterhalter, and uh, this is a, a classic example of 19th century photoshopping, where the Maharaja is made to look much more taller, much more elaborate, and much more flamboyant than he really was. The artist expected the Maharaja to grow uh, a few more inches, but he never did, um, and he, re he remained a short man throughout his life. The Queen, uh, we've got two uh, marble busts there. The Queen on the, the left uh, commissioned the left bust by Baron Maraschetti. The one on the right, many of you may recognise, as this came up for auction 10 years ago in Bonhams. 
and the 20 to 25,000 pound valuation went through the roof when the hammer fell at 1.7 million pounds. Now, I was researching this bust for Bonham's Auction House, and I discovered that uh, for 20 years, this bust was on a pedestal on the front garden of a cottage uh, in the countryside in Blow Norton. And nobody ever noticed it. The, owners, the owner, uh, his son, was an alcoholic, and he tried to offer this to the local people in the village for £50 for drink money. But nobody wanted to buy it from him. And uh, it just so happens, I was giving a talk six months ago in the village of Blow Norton, and I told the people of Blow Norton, I said, this bust came from your village, and the owner offered it for £50 but nobody wanted to buy it. And as I said that, a gentleman from the audience stood up and, and said, excuse me, I was offered that bust by that man in the 1970s for 40 pounds, but I refused it because I thought it was a bit of a voodoo doll. So I put the question to him, I said, well, do you regret not investing 40 pounds, which would have accumulated to 1.7 million? And he said, no, I have no regrets. And I thought, what a liar, because I would have regretted it. The Maharaja now became the ideal party accessory, invited to every royal gathering, every noble party of its day. And here we can see him pictured on the front page of the graphic newspaper behind Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace. The Maharaja had many homes in the United Kingdom. Um, the Logans took him to Scotland, where he was initiated into grouse shooting. He was one of the finest, uh, finest shots in the country. Uh, they took a castle from him at Mengis, and also, he leased a castle um, in Whitby called Mulgrave Castle, uh, where the Maharaja was said to ride around on elephants. Around 1860, the Maharaja had an urge to meet his mother. It had been some 13 years since he had last seen her. He sent a letter via a native travelling banker, which was intercepted by British intelligence. But the British now felt the Maharani was old, she was frail, and she was virtually blind. She was no danger to them now, so they, so they decided let mother and son meet. So Dilip Singh was allowed to go to, the, uh, to go to India, not allowed to go to the Punjab. He went to Calcutta, and at Spencer's Hotel, he met his mother after 13 and a half years. It just so happened that the Sikh soldiers, which were now part of the British Indian Army, were returning back from the China War. And they, heard, they had heard that the Maharaja was in town. And suddenly, crowds of Sikhs began gathering outside the hotel chanting the Maharaja's name, telling him that they are behind him. The British be became alarmed, and they told the Maharaja that he must return back to England for the safety of the empire. And if he wished, he could take his mother with him. The Leap Singh didn't argue. He brought his mother back to England. He took up a house for her at Lancaster Gate, and he had his fam fam favourite family portrait artist, George Richmond, painter in this beautiful oil painting. And I'm proud to say that this painting is now in the collection of Dr. Kapani. Sadly, after meeting her, her son after 18 months, Maharani Jindgore passed away in London. A few months later, the Leap Singh lost another parent, Sir John Logan, a father figure to him for the last 10 years. It is said that at his funeral, the Leap Singh openly wept and said, today I've lost my father. In 1864, Dilip Singh was finally given permission to take his mother's remains to India. It was illegal at the time to cremate in England, so he had to take her to India for, its for her last cremation rites. Again, he wasn't allowed to go to the Punjab. Um, he was given permission to go to Bombay, and he would cremate his mother on the banks of the river Godavari. On the way to Bombay, he stopped at Cairo at a missionary school, where he was introduced to a 15-year-old German Abyssinian young lady called Bamba Muller. He fell in love with Bamba and he proposed to her straight away and for some strange reasons he accepted. He told the mission school to prepare his new bride for after carrying out the duties of a son he would come back to Cairo and marry his new bride. And the photograph on the right is the Maharani in her wedding robes in June 1864. He took his new bride to his newly purchased Elvidon estate a 30,000 uh, 30, acre uh, Norfolk estate in East Anglia. It was um, a fairly modest country house, but the Maharaja had it completely renovated, and this is how it looked when he had finished with it. He wanted the house to be reminiscent to the fine Mughal palaces he had been accustomed to as a young 
Sikh prince. And he had the house refitted internally. And this is how the drawing room looked of Elverton Hall. As I mentioned, the Leap Singh was one of the finest shots in the country. And he held annual hunting parties, shoots at, um, at Elverton Hall. And the Prince of Wales, seated in the center in the bowler hat, was a regular visitor to the Maharaja's hunting parties. As the Maharaja moved to Elwoodan, the house began to fill with children. Here we can see five of the Maharaja's six children. To run quickly uh, through them, we had Prince Victor, the elder son. It was basically a waste of space. Um, he was a failure in the army. He was a gambler. He was constantly getting into financial trouble, and his brother was bailing him out. Prince Frederick, the second son, an antiquarian and a historian. Princess Bamba, the eldest daughter, who outlived her entire family and died at the age of 89 in Lahore. Princess Catherine, uh, the very secretive daughter, um, who lived uh, most of her life in Germany and during the Second World War helped Jews escape from Nazi Germany. Princess Sophia, the youngest daughter, the, the fanatical suffragette, and young Prince Edward Albert, who died at the age of 13 due to a subsiding of his stomach. We can see some portraits um, of Prince Victor the Leipzig, the one on the left by George Richmond, the one on the right by Sidney Hall, which was commissioned on the prince's 13th birthday and presented to Queen Victoria as a gift. Some photographs of the princesses. Um, the picture on the right is um, Princess Catherine on the top, uh, Princess Bamba and Sophia uh, seated at the bottom. And this photograph was on the formal presentation at court uh, of Queen Victoria. Uh, Prince Frederick the Leipzig, who joined the uh, Norfolk and Suffolk uh, regiments and also served in the First World War. And here we can see a character mimic, uh, comicking or mimicking uh, Maharaja Dalip Singh, showing him with a pot belly and receding hairline. Now, during the 1870s, the Maharaja was finding it very difficult uh, to bring up a royal family or a royal household on his pension. He was promised a pension of 40 to 50,000 pounds per annum, but at best he was receiving 15 to 25. The government felt that this was adequate for him uh, to bring up a royal household. The Maharaja began delving into his financial affairs. He was unhappy and requested a trial. He asked for his cousin, Thakur Singh Sandhavalia, to look into his fi financial affairs. And the following year, Thakur Singh, with two of his sons and a Sikh priest from the Golden Temple, arrived in London. And Thakur Singh had some very important news for him. He told the Maharaja that at the time of annexation, the Maharaja's personal family property, his Per personal possessions and landed property, which were Ranjit Singh's property before he had become, or before he'd come to the throne of the Lahore, had illegally been confiscated alongside state property. The Maharaja requested a trial from the government again. It was rejected. The government was never going to give in to him. His family salt mines in the Punjab had an annual income of £350,000 per annum, yet his pension was only £25,000. The Leap Singh decided enough was enough. He packed his bags, sold his possessions, took his family and headed to India. When the ship docked at Aden, the Maharaja was arrested. He was told he could not proceed to India for the security of the empire. To save face, the Maharaja sent his children back to, to England, to London, and stayed in Aden to make one last stand against the British. His first act of defiance was to call upon his cousins in the Punjab to come to Aden so he could be reinitiated into the Sikh faith. Some months later, he became ill in, in Aden, and the British felt that the Maharaja must be moved to a cooler climate, as it would have been terrible if he had died whilst under house arrest. Maharaja Dalip Singh was told he could go anywhere in Europe, but if he attempted to go to India, very harsh steps would be taken against him. Dalip Singh headed to Paris. He firstly met up with his mistress from London, Ada Weverall, and then a whole array of dissatis dissatisfied organizations approached him. Agents of the Russian king, the French underworld, but the Irish Fenians, and even German intelligence was keeping an eye on the Maharaja. Katkov had this bizarre plan. He told the Maharaja that the king of Russia would give him 20,000 soldiers to march into India via Afghanistan. And when the Maharaja reached the Punjab plains, the Sikhs in the Indian army who would be sent to oppose him would come to his side. The Fenians would arrange for the Irish regiments in the Indian army to rebel at the rear. 
The plan was ludicrous and it was never going to happen. Little did the Maharaja know that Colonel Tevis, an American Irish, there had to be an American angle in this story, an American Irish was a spy who was actually deployed to infiltrate the Fenian movement, was now moved within the Maharaja's household. From that point, every letter, every communication, every person that the Maharaja met was copied in and sent to London's foreign office. So the British knew his exact movements. The media took a mick out of the Leap Singh's actions. It showed Katkov, dressed as the Russian bear, playing the flute, and the Leap Singh dancing to his every tune. The Leap Singh did reach Russia, but when he arrived, he had found that Katkov had been murdered. Weeks later, he was told his cousin Thakra Singh Sandawalia in the Punjab had been poisoned. The Leap Singh was heartbroken. He came back to Paris and settled in Paris life when he was told his wife, Bamba Mullah, or Maharani Bamba, had also died after a short illness. The Leap Singh was truly heartbroken. His health began to fail. He later married his mistress, Ada Weverall. Uh, they had two daughters, Pauline and Irene. And the Leap Singh suffered a series of strokes. He could barely pick up a pen. He asked for his son, Prince Victor, to visit him and write to the Queen to ask for a formal apology. That summer, the Queen visited the south of France. The Leap Singh fell to her feet. He wept. Queen Victoria still had affection for her favourite Sikh prince and she granted him a royal pardon, much to the dismay of her ministers. On the 21st of October, 1893, in a hotel room in Paris, all on his own, the Leap Singh suffered an apoplectic fit. He lingered unconscious for a whole day and was found the next morning dead. A man destined to be the king of the Punjab died penniless, destitute, and all on his own in a shabby hotel room in Paris. To finish on, on a more merrier note, in 1999, the current Prince of Wales unveiled this bronze equestrian statue to the Maharaja to honour his stay and his residence at uh, the town of Fetford. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't um, overstep my 15 minutes.